Hello and welcome to my first masterclass video on Surface Builder. Now in this video I want to go through some of the basics, uh, the kind of things that you would want to ask uh, if you were running this for the first time. And so I'm going to go over some of those uh, pitfalls and uh, some of the things that people might be doing wrong. And as always it's easiest to start in AUM uh, for these demos. And I'm going to start by creating uh, two instrument, well, two tracks, one an instrument track and another a MIDI track. And I want to show you the difference between the two. So now I've created an instrument and a MIDI track. I'm going to load a copy of Surface Builder into each of these tracks. Now if I tap on the instrument track to open Surface Builder and uh, resize the interface, uh, the first thing you want to do is press the menu button and create a new surface. Now I've gone with the defaults there. And we start off with this grid. Now this grid is zoomable so I can put two things on screen and pinch to zoom. Uh, if you want to resize that, we can always go to back to the menu and hit resize grid. And uh, these grids can be quite big, well, as big as, or as small as you require. But I'm just going to stick with that for now. And the idea is to add objects to this grid. And I'm going to start off with the button ob object, which is probably the simplest and most complex object uh, in the whole uh, uh, suite of objects. That are available and uh, we can drag this around and if we tap in the bottom right corner we can resize that um, now uh, when we press that button currently it will do nothing but if we tap on that object we will bring up the object properties dialog now the object properties allows us to configure this button and if you notice on the right hand side channel is set to off but we can quickly change this to on and using that combination of uh, channel port and value we can send currently MIDI notes uh, on the press of that button but you need to confirm this by pressing the save button otherwise those changes will not be saved now as well as being able to send MIDI the button can do a whole myriad of things and if we press the function button we'll get a pop-up uh, menu of things that we can do with this button and if you look at some of these items are audio related such as play audio or play audio one shot now we can drag and drop a audio clip directly to that button or we can press this clip button underneath the function button and uh, this is our local store of audio files. Whenever we drag an audio file onto a button, it adds it, adds it to this store. And uh, once that's been attached, we can come out of edit mode and we can preview that by pressing uh, the button. And as you can see, that button is configured as a dual press. When we press the button, the audio starts. When we press it again, it stops. So when we're performing internal tasks like this, we don't necessarily need the, uh, the object to be sending MIDI. So in this case, I've got the channel turned off. Now, if you wanted to remote control that button, you could actually turn that back on again. And that incoming message would then trigger that button and play back that audio. Now by contrast I'm going to open the copy of Surface Builder on the MIDI track and do exactly the same thing. I'm going to create a new surface and go with the default dimensions. And I'm going to add a button just as we did before with the instrument track. Now you'll notice that when we go to the object properties this time and look at the functions that are available they're few and far between because all the audio functionality has gone out of this list. I can't tell you how many people have, have asked me why the audio function is out there when we're working with a MIDI track. Just be aware of that. Now we're going to look at an example which uh, involves two uh, different uh, surfaces that interact with each other. And so I've created two instrument channels here and put a copy of Surface Builder on each. 
and if I open them up you can see that they are just empty surfaces currently. Now I'm going to start off with the first of these instrument channels and I'm going to add a button object to that surface. And we do that by pressing the add button and picking the button object. Now I'm going to size this button uh, something like that. And if we uh, if we tap the button the object properties will come up and we can give that button a nice color. And if we press the label button we can give that button a name. Now if you if you turn on the both states uh, option at the bottom here um, it will label both states of the button because they can be independent labels. Now if I exit edit mode and uh, put my finger on that button you'll see that the button only remains pressed when I've got my finger on that button and that's because it's a single state. We can toggle that to a dual state and then when we test that out you'll see that when I lift my finger off the button it changes colour. When I press it again it toggles back to the green. Uh, that's a dual state button. Now to change the colour of the alternate state I'm going to press the state button here and you'll see that it changes to the uh, alternate colour and we're free then to uh, set up the colour or label for this state. Notice before we actually changed uh, both labels uh, in one go using that both states button. Now I've got a button how I like it I'm going to duplicate it by put, touching two fingers to the surface with this button selected and dragging my fingers to the right and then releasing and that will duplicate that button uh, however many times you want. Tap anywhere on the grid to deselect. Now I'm going to go to the second button and I'm just going to rename it and again I'm going to uh, tick on the both states so that both states are renamed at the same time. Now once we've got the three buttons uh, on the surface if we toggle out of edit mode and just press those three buttons you'll see they just they're just pressable buttons have all got the same properties but I want to show you how to uh, toggle uh, those settings now I noticed that the color there was not great there wasn't a distinction of color so I'm going to make that first one blue or the second state blue and I'm going to copy that uh, to uh, each of the three buttons so that each of the reverse states is blue rather than green and I'm going to assign each of these buttons to uh, a group uh, in this case group one and now when I exit uh, edit mode and test this out you'll see that now we have a group of three buttons but only one can be active at any one time so it's mutually excluding the other buttons now right now these buttons when we press them do not send any MIDI at all but we're going to change that and to do that we're going to come into the properties and we're going to change that channel from off to uh, on and we're going to configure each of these buttons to send a CC command uh, with a value of zero for the first button, one for the second, and two for the third. Now for those of you that don't know CC is just simply control the change and is, is an alternative message to the note on off. We probably want to use controller changes for most things unless we are trying to trigger notes on a destination device. Now as I flick between these buttons we can see we're now configured correctly and uh, we are configured to send out three different unique messages. Now here's one I prepared earlier. I've configured three exactly the similar buttons in the second surface builder and I'm going to apply exactly the same MIDI settings to each of those three buttons so that each button uh, has the same message button one in surface one has the same MIDI message as button one in surface two and so on now once all these are configured we can start to make these two surfaces talk with each other so if we start by clicking on the hamburger menu of surface one and click on the inputs we want to check our input from surface two 
and vice versa. If we click on the hamburger of surface 2, it wants to check its input from surface 1. And we're, we're going to port 1 of uh, surface 1. Now, if we start clicking on these buttons in the two surfaces, you'll see that they're actually in sync. Different colours, but in sync. And this shows the bidirectionality of the of, of Surface Builder and shows how you can use incoming MIDI to control the state of objects on your surface. So let's now take a look at uh, adding another different type of object to each of these surfaces. Um, let's just resize that uh, Surface 2 a little bit. And uh, in this case, we'll put a rotary knob object on the surface and resize it a little bit. Now, these come in all different shapes and sizes. Just about every object has multiple styles, and we can get at those by clicking the Styles button. And I happen to really like this uh, aluminium kind of looking knob. And uh, if we um, just give that some, uh, some value, we can see and configure the little lights around it, which uh, I think look quite nice. Now I'm going to assign some MIDI parameters, and this time I'm going to go for CC with a value of 5, um, using channel 1, port 1. And uh, just make sure that button is configured. And uh, when we move to surface 2, we're going to add another rotary button, maybe make it a different style this time. Um, there's, like I said, there's plenty of styles to choose from. Um, and I'm going to set up the, uh, the this as CC5, just as we did before on Surface 1. Now, if we exit edit mode on both of these, they're both wired up. So in theory, I just need to turn one and the other one turns. And I can go to Surface 2 and turn that rotary value in, uh, knob in Surface 2 and Surface 1 will reflect that. So this really is the, uh, the whole purpose of this is to show that bidirectionality. In the real world, you wouldn't want one surface to be controlling another. But what it does, it demonstrates how incoming MIDI could trigger, say, um, uh, audio clips and so on. So now I want to take a look at presentation mode. So let's imagine we've just created this fantastic interface here. And uh, we want to use this in a live situation. Well, to be honest, we don't need the toolbars here. Uh, it, it's just one more thing to hit by accident. Now, obviously, during a performance, we won't be in edit mode, and but we don't really want that toolbar there. So simply double tapping anywhere in the interface will hide that toolbar, and we will enter presentation mode. Double tapping again will exit presentation mode. Now, there's a neat trick to uh, save any surface in presentation mode. And the way we do it is to first enter presentation mode by double tapping. And then double tap with two fingers. And the original menu will pop up, allowing us to pick save. And the fact that we're in presentation mode uh, will be saved along with that surface. And when that surface is loaded, it will be in presentation mode. So let's exit the world of a UV3 for a minute and look at standalone mode and accessing dedicated hardware or Bluetooth devices. Now I've got in front of me a surface here which has a number of buttons which uh, send MIDI chord data to uh, a connected hardware device. Now for any of you wondering, this is just a button with a, a special function attached called play chord. Now, once this has been assigned to a button, you can use the data button below uh, to start assigning uh, various chords uh, to your button. And there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, so we can set the, uh, the chord and we can set the octave. We can set the inversion. And uh, we can choose a bass, either one or two octaves below. One quick uh, way of getting to this configuration dialog, if you're not in edit mode, so if we come out of edit mode, you just swipe down on any of these uh, core buttons and you'll get instant access to that menu. 
Now I want the output of these chord buttons to go to my uh, Yamaha keyboard behind me and uh, that keyboard is connected via Bluetooth. Now if we open the uh, object properties for this chord button we'll see two uh, buttons uh, for configuration of hardware ports and uh, Bluetooth devices in the bottom of this dialog. And if I take a look at the Bluetooth devices, you'll see that my, um, my Bluetooth device for my uh, Yamaha is currently connected, uh, but my Nano Studio isn't. And if I turn my Nano Studio on, you'll see that it'll auto-connect. Not all things will auto-connect. You may have to connect them by clicking on them manually. Now, it's important once your physical devices are connected to port map them. Now, by default, all 16 ports are internally mapped to AUV3 defaults. We need to map each of these to a dedicated hardware port and this is incredibly important if you are running in standalone mode. So port 1 is now mapped to my uh, MIDI keyboard using the Bluetooth interface. So sending to port 1 is equivalent of sending to my Yamaha keyboard right now. Now to help with this uh, I suggest that you go over to the main menu and in the show windows uh, section sub menu we can find the MIDI monitor. Now by default uh, MIDI monitor is monitoring everything coming into Surface Builder so we need to change this uh, little button here to display output and now when we press on these uh, chord buttons not only will you see what's been sent you'll also see the port name that it's been sent to in this case uh, my uh, bluetooth uh, midi device connected to my yamaha keyboard now we can also toggle this uh, uh, monitor button to uh, debug mode which will display uh, anything incoming regardless of whether it's been mapped or not normally you wouldn't get any information if you hadn't mapped the port but the debug mode can tell you that. Now the one great thing about uh, going straight to ports, hardware MIDI ports, is that it's truly bi-directional. Whereas using the AUV3 port facilities, we can send out on any port, but we can only re uh, receive information on the first port, MIDI port one. And that's a bit of a limitation of, uh, of the way um, uh, currently uh, AUV3 works. So let's backtrack a little and go uh, back into AUM and back to the example that we started earlier. And I'm going to show you how we can trigger audio clips uh, remotely uh, using uh, these two surfaces we created. And the first thing I'm going to do is on surface 2 I'm going to uh, add a new button. I'm going to make it a long and thin button. And if we tap on that to bring up the um, properties I'm going to choose uh, play audio from the list of functions that I can assign to this button and if I click on the clip below uh, it's going to open up the uh, internal uh, audio pool now you can drag and drop from uh, the files app if you want and uh, it will work just the same way now if we exit edit mode and swipe down on that button we get the controls for that button just like what happened with the chord buttons when we swipe down and if you notice there I've enabled the waveform so that when we play back we can see the progression of that waveform and how fast through we are. Now if I shrink that window slightly and go back to surface 1 I'm going to add a button that will trigger this so back in Surface 1, we need to first add a button. Um, and we'll rename that button uh, Play, for want of a better word. And again, I'm going to re rename both states of that button. Now, give it a colour. Now, the button as it stands is not sending MIDI and if we press that button you'll see it's just a button and it's not dual state and we want it to be so let's change from single state to dual state and let's change the MIDI parameters so that either enabled and we're going to change it to CC20 
uh, sounds about right. We've, it's one we haven't actually used, so CC20. And then if we come back to uh, Surface 2 and click on the, uh, uh, the button that plays the clip, we set that to uh, CC20 as well. And don't forget to hit the Save button. Then uh, when we come out of Edit Mode on both of these, I can press the play button and it will start playback of the clip in Surface 2. I can also hit the Surface 2 button and it will play the clip and it will send the, uh, the MIDI in the opposite direction uh, and, uh, and, and change the state of that button on the fly. Now while we're at it we may as well look at a couple of other functions that may be useful alongside the um, audio clips and uh, let me just make a little bit of room on this surface uh, I'll resize the surface a little bring that down uh, I'm going to add um, an audio view meter to the, this display and uh, we are going to make that a little bit bigger now a view meter will normally uh, give you the, the, the levels of audio passing through so this is, um, if you've got a multiple uh, audio clips here, it will give you the combined sum of the output of the audio clips or whatever's passing through. But we can, uh, we can change that. We can um, pick this, uh, this special function which allows us then to pick an audio clip that we want to attach uh, those meters to. And we could tell one meter to be the left channel, and we could tell the other meter to be the right channel. And uh, and that way, when we uh, exit edit mode and play back the clip, uh, we can see that the meters are metering along with the, uh, the playback of the clip. Now for this example, we're going to look at another object, the time clock object, and, uh, and see how that works. Now. The time clock object uh, generally uh, works by giving us the position uh, of the host. Um, so by default, when we drop one of these time clocks in, and let me just resize that a bit. Now, if I hit play in AUM's transport, you'll see that we get the current bar and beat, typical bar and beat display. Now we can come into the uh, properties dialog, we I've removed the border there as you can see, but we can also change the format so I can display hours, minutes and seconds, which is uh, just an, an alternate format. But it, what you'll notice here is that it's displaying host time and not the time of the clip. Now we can look at the functions here and you'll see that there's actually an option we can pick called audio clip time and then we can actually select the exact clip we want to uh, to keep track of and now when we start playing that clip you'll see that the clock advances with the clip so i think that's just about it for this beginner's guide uh, you may have seen one or two things here that are not in that version you have right now because i'm working on new editions that will be out soon so don't forget to thumb up the video and don't forget to subscribe to the channel I'll see you next time.